My birthday's in, on St. Patrick's Day, so I always joke that like every movie that comes out that is like kind of some like close to a St. Patrick's Day uh, theme is specifically made for me. So I'm very glad that I get to talk with you for Irish Wish. I mean, I just love the fact we're getting to talk together to, to again. Um, and actually see each other this time, which is great. Each other, yes. Yeah. But happy birthday. Oh, thank, you. Very <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you. It's actually my dad's birthday when this film comes out, which oh, I'm sure yes. is the birthday present he never he didn't know he needed, you know? Didn't know he needed it. Um, I love that. Um, one of my first questions for you was actually going to be, how did you enjoy the uh, Star Trek cruise? I had a blast. I mean, as you well know, the Star Trek fandom are, they are intense, but it's from such a position of warmth. And the energy is so positive that, yeah, it's hard, it's hard not to find it incredibly infectious. Uh, yeah, I had a great time. Also, the Caribbean, like you're just cruising around the Caribbean and then like doing, like having a few like chats about Star Trek in between, you know, as the days go on. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I loved time. Excellent. Secondly, I wanted to talk about that gorgeous red Triumph TR4 that you get to drive in Irish Wish. That car was amazing to see on screen. How is it to get to drive that around a little? So I love vintage cars. So, and in particular, that era, you know, whether it be older Jags, you know, whether it be E types or Aston Martins, but, but that Triumph that it, it was an it was it, it was a Triumph to drive. Uh, I'd um, I I think some of my favorite scenes were bombing around in that. I just I felt like I was in a, a much older. It was like a classic throwback to a different era of movie making. Uh, it felt like a different part of cinema, and I feel that yeah. I mean those the, those sort of cars I I absolutely love. I'm a big fan of convertibles anyway. Uh, and yeah, I mean just bombing around Ireland and that was a was a real treat. I did try and plug away to everybody, being like this car. It's you know I, I kind of suit this car. Um, but no one let me keep it, obviously. No, I, I will admit I rewound a couple of times to watch it in action a few more times because I also love vintage cars. And I was like, the, the scenery with that car was just so perfect. Right. Um, so I was green with envy that you got to be like in Ireland in this gorgeous location, but the car really sold the envy for me. Yeah, as I say, some of my favorite scenes were in the car, Maggie. Like, and actually, and it's interesting because the car's quite intimate, uh, it's fun. And I felt that actually it, part of it, it had its own character that sort of was able to encapsulate the relationship between uh, Maddie and James. And actually my, my, the reason why my favorite scenes were uh, in the car is because I felt that that's when you saw the relationship between those two start to really solidify. It became clearer and, and actually, because it was just the two of them, there's nothing else around and they had to, understand each other better and start to get into each other's personalities more. It's the closest you can get to a road trip movie when it's all kind of very insular within this one location in Ireland. Um, and that's a good point that you make about their relationship. Cause there's another kind of minor detail that I noticed was the fact that they always seem to be kind of color coordinated with their costumes. And I was right. wondering if that was something that was ever discussed with you at all, but by the costumer or the director, because it's subtle, they're always either in the same palette or palettes that complement each other very well. Uh, I mean, Tim, uh, the costume designer who I liked immensely. He didn't. I mean, definitely there are palettes and 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 color schemes and patterns that one wants to incorporate. Right? You have your overall look and feel for a film that you want. You know, for whatever artistic license you want it to come across in a certain way. But I think that he didn't say I want you to be paired up with with Mali. He didn't tell me that on purpose. But maybe there were definite details to to overlap. Maybe that was a choice that we weren't privy to. But interestingly, you picked up on that for sure. It was very noticeable. I tend to look at costumes and see how things kind of work and create the whole picture. And this is such a beautiful movie. There's so much pop and color and it goes kind of back to what you were saying with the car that it kind of harkens back to this older style of storytelling where there's so much emphasis on the entire picture. And it really helps to like sell the relationship and the story that's happening in this movie. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, these types of film should should pop, I suppose. There should be a brightness, right? There should be, and it should be, it's not because it's, I wouldn't say it's stylized, but I feel that you should have clear choices made that 
that elevate things that allow people to, to to go on a journey and escape and you want to see people wearing good clothes and you want to see people in 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 fancy cars but in yeah in a in a throwback to a to a bygone era for sure mm-hmm. and i love that rom-coms are very much getting their their moment to shine again you know we just had this movie that was in theaters that was one of the most you know best selling you know films in a, in a while with uh anyone but you so it's great to see that this like uh rom-com vibe is coming back and i was curious for you what inspired you to pursue this film was it the script was there some element to it that really struck and kind of stuck with you I think it was a combination of things Maggie I mean I, firstly at the time I was wrapping up my time my 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 stint as Reese Montrose in you and Netflix came directly to me and said we, well, we've got the script it's a, it's a romantic comedy with Lindsay do you want to do it? And it was a straight offer. And I felt, hang on, this is a great opportunity for me to continue my working relationship with Netflix who I've loved working with the last few years but also, if you're going to step into the world of romantic comedies, who better to do it with than Lindsay Lohan? Like, you know, she's the queen of this type of cinema. And it felt it felt like such a great way for me to make a slight adjustment from the type of work that I'd been doing for quite a long time, which were very sort of intense roles that required uh, an abundance of, like, soul searching and emotion and, 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 you know, they put me through the ringer at times. And this is a very different entity and a different form of working. You know, there are still parameters within that that you have to adhere to and that you still have to play the truth and find your way through or you know, to, to make sure the character sings, as it were. But for me, it was a really lovely adjustment just being able to sort of let the shackles like be, you know, come off and enjoy it and actually see what what goes into making a romantic comedy. Because one of the th- things that took me by surprise, I suppose, is quite often scenes in these types of films are very short there's not journeys within them. And actually you still have to, you, quite often there's a joke at the end of it or there's a punchline and you have to get out and then you move on to the next one. And you have to tell a very quick story within each beat and in, in each scene. And, and actually that's a real skill. And I think people may not realize that about romantic comedies, that there is there is a certain degree. You, it's, and it's also getting that line right in romantic comedies where you it is light. And it's borderline, you can borderline get into a cheesy world, but don't don't let it flip over too much, right? have to keep it you have to and for me it's really important whatever character you're playing you're still finding that level of of truth so that we can relate to these people and actually believe who they are yeah i love rom-coms i love that there's a a very clear like formula and and you're used to it if you watch a lot of rom-coms but you're always looking for like the surprise twist the fun change from kind of the the typical trope that you're familiar with and i i loved what irish wish was doing so much with the story they were telling with Maddie and James and the relationship was so believable and the the magic of it all is very fun, which was yeah. a surprising element. I always like a little magic, but I wanted to know one of my favorite scenes in it was the wedding chaos, the fight. Was that as fun to film as it is to watch? Yes. I mean, for me, it was interestingly much like the character, James, he's watching a lot of the time and actually other than the scenes, with Maddie on his own, a lot of the movie he's just he's observing and watching. And the wedding scene is more or less that until he gets caught out and accused. And then as a result, he and this whole fight debacle unravels between him and uh and Paul Kennedy, who actually interestingly, one of my best friends is actually called Paul Kennedy. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> one of my best friends in the in the world. He's just had a, his first child. He's just had a baby boy. But yeah, so it's it's quite interesting that this that my sort of uh, nemesis within the film is also called Paul Kennedy. But yeah, no, that was a great, you know, that was a great day to shoot. And, you know, I like getting to do the fight stuff anyway. The physical side is something that I really um, uh, I, I love. And and I feel it's something well within my sort of wheelhouse of, of being where I'm comfortable. But doing it where it's more slapstick and more jokey is a whole other beast to, to to unravel and tackle but yeah I mean, it, was a, it was a good fun day and it was chaotic it was very fun to watch um i remember when i interviewed you for uh jack crusher for picard you had said you had a playlist for jack did you have a playlist for james at all that, that helped you get into the mood really no I, I mean i listen to a lot of so quite often as you say I, and most characters i do with james i didn't but because i i, I quite like a lot of uh i say music that is quite global uh, and I feel because of his profession as a wildlife photographer, he is so well traveled that I ended up listening to a lot more of that music. So music I listen to anyway. So whether it be music from Nigeria and Senegal or whether it be from like Latin America or, you know, the, you know, all sorts of, you know, things from all over the world. So the, the classics are sort of like Fela Kuti and that, you know, Chait Lowe and people like that. But yeah, I would listen to 
more, I suppose, world music, Afrobeat, a lot of it, basically. Very good. Very good. And talking about Jack, I did want to, of course, talk a little bit about Star Trek Picard. More than happy. More than happy. I, yes, of course. Um, you know, it's been a year since Picard ended, which I just still can't wrap my head around. And a little bit at the start of this uh, interview, you talked about, you know, being on the cruise and getting to interact with fans a lot more. What has it meant to you to see how, um, I don't want to say obsessive, but passionate fans have been about trying to will into existence Star Trek Legacy? Uh, it's it's a funny one, Maggie, because it, I, sometimes I wake up with huge uh, warmth and, and a great sense of appreciation towards that. And other times I'm almost frustrated that we're not we're not we're not there because I, I you, you when you talk to the people that have been so enraptured by that final season and, you know, the desire to tell more stories for Jack. I think the thing is, there's so there's still so many stories that can be told for Jack Crusher and it's teed up. And I I do believe it will happen at some point. And I feel that we will get there. But I think that people have just got to keep being noisy about it. I mean, I, I, I absolutely loved playing that role. And I think if I could do that for another 10, 15, 20 years, I hands down would. Star Trek, in many ways... I, would, I, I think changing my life is such a such a big phrase, so I don't want to say that, but it definitely realigned things for me creatively. And actually, the run of the run of work since then has been re- like really interesting. But that part, I feel like I've still got so much to, to offer with him, and I, I just I really, really hope and want and believe that we will get that chance at some point. I know I, mean, I definitely will not let up on that desire for it to happen. Every time there's everyone, a everyone, to, everyone seems to want to. We just got to keep putting the noise out there. I mean, I would love it. I would absolutely love to play more. I mean, and that ties so perfectly into like the history of Star Trek, which is fans have always kind of been the ones being like, no, we want more of this thing. This is the thing that we want. And they will yeah. never stop being loud about it, which I love. And I think it's important. I think, look, look, people have all got their own ideas about what works, what doesn't. But I feel that it's important to listen to people. And when you have a group of fans that have followed a certain world or, or franchise um, for 60 years, this, it, it makes sense to listen to what they've got to say. Yeah. I mean, they know what works. Um, yeah. Do you do you have in your mind kind of where you see Jack's future going, whether, you know, Star Trek Legacy happens or not, but have you kind of conceptualized your own vision for his future? Yeah. I mean, I visualize it almost daily <laughs> and what could be and the stories that we could tell, the adventures we can go on. And Terry Metalis and I have sort of waxed lyrical about it uh, on many occasions. And I think that's the thing. There is There is so much scope within that. And there's so much scope with other characters as well, you know, old and new. That I think it would be, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, as I say, I often visualize where he can end up, you know. I, and the good thing is I think the sky's the limit for for, for his character. And I think what would be really interesting, as Terry and I have talked about, is that it's not going to be a clear line of, you know, it's not a straight linear path to to to, to balance and success. I think for a character like that, he's always going to have elements that are going to torture him. And I think he's going to have things that are going to veer him off course. And I think that'll be a really interesting uh, psychological build up and battle for him. I know everything that Terry has told me about like his, his dreams for Star Trek legacy. I'm like, I need it now. There's, there's so much good stuff there and storytelling potential that, you know, the fans need. I think the fans need and want, and I think people need to realize how, you know, I have the greatest deal of respect for Star Trek fans because, and actually the shows in general, as a result of being a part of it, I've now, I'm a hook, line and sinker because of what it does, because of what it's done historically in terms of pushing, like pushing boundaries, pushing diversity, making sure everyone's inclusive. Like the, the, the general message of Starfleet is to bring people and species together. You know, we, and we and right the world we're living in right now. What is a more pertinent message, right? So I feel that there is so much more scope to be had. I, I just, I would, I would absolutely love it, and I would welcome the opportunity with open arms. Absolutely. Now that you have kind of gotten your feet wet with the Star Trek fandom up close and personal on the cruise, do you think you're going to do more conventions and events like this, or is it kind of just uh, feeling it out? I mean, I, I, look, I, I actually really love meeting people that are so passionate about it. And and I think the, as I come back to saying earlier on, the warmth that they offer up uh, and the knowledge they have on the subject, it, it kind of uh, overwhelmed me really with, uh, with seeing this great sense of community amongst people. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely up for doing more of those events because it's, it's a great way to go meet people that love the thing you're a part of. And it's a good way to converse on that. And it's also a good way to keep, Spreading the message about the Star Trek legacy. Yeah. Legacy. Yeah. What do you think? 
think was some of the biggest things that you took away from being at Picard, whether it be, you know, something you learn about yourself as an actor or something that kind of just carried with you onto your next projects? I'll be honest. I felt that playing that role gave me a huge amount of self-belief. Um, I, th- I, tell, I tell what it did. I th- think Stephen Bonnet and Outlander definitely opened my eyes to what was possible what, 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 by pushing the envelope a little bit and starting to discover that I could play these nefarious, you know, psychos. But I think what Jack Crusher, Jack Crusher did, and I hope I haven't done, don't, don't jump the gun here, is it actually told me that if, if and when the right opportunity arises that I could lead a show. I think, you know, although I wasn't the lead in that series, it was definitely, you know, Jack's story was incredibly important throughout the whole way through. Uh, and it made me, it filled me with confidence to know that that is definitely what I want to be doing. It's some, something I believe I, I should be doing. Uh, and I think that for me is the, the, the natural next step. I feel like fans got that impression as well. So you're not alone in feeling like you could lead an entire series. So it's definitely. Well, I feel I'm ready for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed that happens. Um, I remember the last time we talked, I think you were going to film something that was set in the sixties. I believe that's Midas man. Is that what that ended up being? Yes, yeah. That is Midas man. Yeah. How was that uh, experience? It was great. I mean, there was a lovely, it's a really cool. I really love the director on that. Joe Stevenson, really, really talented up and coming director. Someone, for sure to watch out for and to be seen hired everywhere in my, in my opinion, uh, a lovely cast, you know, uh, Jacob Fortune Lloyd, Emily Watson, Eddie Marzan, some really, really cool actors. And, you know, telling, you know, as you, I think we've discussed, I'm a big music fan and that period is pretty important to me. I grew up on a lot of the Beatles. My dad was a, is a huge Beatles fan. Um, I was always more stones, but because of my dad, I've always got an affinity to, you know, my son's called Jude. Hey, Jude gets played almost on the daily at home. Um, he, but, but to go and play this again, a slightly more nefarious character, someone who is living on the edge. He's an outsider. He's from, you know, he's from New York. He's a bit of a hustler. He wants to be an actor. He wants to be a singer. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He, and he goes in and he, he, he kind of takes advantage of Brian, really. He, he's not, you know, but he's also what we know about, Brian Epstein, as he was, you know, it was not easy for him to to be living in in that in that time. You know, he had to do everything. You know, had to be so uh, underground, and his and his so his ideas of love and relationships had to be so underground. So it meant that he ended up hanging out with you know maybe slightly uh, uh, outsider characters who maybe weren't necessarily the best people for him. And I, you know, the guy of text that I played was definitely that. But I had a good, uh, we had a really lovely time, Jacob and I working together. And I, I haven't seen the film yet, but I'm, I'm hoping it, it turns out to be as good as it was to shoot it. I'm excited. Everything that I've heard so far from it sounds like it's going to be a, a one to see for certain. Okay. Um, but something you said, they're talking about it being like a historical piece and then talking about Out- Outlander had me thinking like, do you approach roles differently depending on those time periods that they're in or even even if they're in space, does it change at all the way that you think about those characters or approach those characters? I mean, yes and no. I think I think I do. I do take on an approach based on circumstance, depending on who I'm dealing with and how I. I it, it, so you do have to allow that to be the case. But fundamentally, for me, it's always about boiling down the character and understanding who the human being is. And I need to get also, no matter who you're playing you have to understand their point of view. I might not have to agree with them, but I Ed has to understand it and be on board with it for the purpose of, of playing the role. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are, there's always, there's always certain things that will be used in every buildup of every character, but there's also other things that, that won't be, I will mix it up from time to time, depending on what there's no, I don't necessarily have a steadfast linear way of, of reaching the point of being ready for a role, but because because there's there's so many different elements to what can create that character. But, you know, yeah, there, there's always crossover for sure. Excellent. Well, I think that's about all I have to ask. That was a great conversation. As um, ever, I guess. Yeah. Always a good chat. Yeah, I'm so I, I'm really thrilled with where your career has gone. Obviously, you know, we talked about Aragon the last time we talked. That was the show, the movie that I loved so much as a kid. And I was like, he's going to be a star someday. So it's been such a joy to be on this side of the camera talking about all of these tremendous things that you've gotten to do across your career. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. So I'm just looking to do more now. Yeah, fingers crossed. I'm sure you'll keep getting booked. I hope you your time. 